My name is Dinesh Khanna. I'm a rheumatologist at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Uh, how many of you are from Michigan? I see a couple of you. Detroit. Detroit. I trained at UCLA, Los Angeles, and I moved to Ann Arbor for the weather, right? <laughs> That's what people do. Uh, I'm not a gastroenterologist, but I've been doing this talk for the last 12 years or so. I have a great interest in GI involvement. So we will make it interactive, but there's a lot of material for me to present. So I want to make sure that we also go through the, the slides, but also give you a chance to ask appropriate questions. Ryan has gone to bring these two uh, foundation educational materials. Have you, anybody looked at it before? Only one. Two. Okay. Uh, it would be helpful. Uh, this is an article that I initially wrote with Dan first, and now I've updated it a few times. Uh, it's available online, and he'll be bringing copies. And this is an article that I wrote with Linda, who's a patient with scleroderma and also is a nutritionist. So it might help you. And I think today Dr. Tracy Freck talked about nutrition and scleroderma and hopefully you got a lot out of it. So when we talk about gut, digestive system, we are talking about anything from the mouth to the rectum and anal canal. Everything that's part of it, including river, is part of going from up top into the stomach, large bowel, small bowel, and rectum is part of the digestive system, GI tract, or gut. So question for which part of the body is it left or the right, the liver? Is the liver on the right side or the left side? Right. Who said right? Who thinks it's on the left side? <laughs> they are right. It's on the right side. It's all. So all of us have the food pipe, mouth, you know, food pipe comes here, there's a stomach on the left side, and it goes down and it goes into this small bowel then into large bowel and into the rectum. Scleroderma, unfortunately, can affect all those areas that we are talking about. Almost every person that I have met over the years have some kind of gut involvement. And when you ask the community and you do surveys, about 90% of the people will have some kind of gut involvement. You can talk about dry mouth, you can talk about reflux disease. I'm sure almost everybody out here has some kind of reflux disease. And most people have symptoms. Very rarely you meet a person who says, I don't have any GI symptoms. But then you do endoscopy because they're coughing quite a bit or something else, and you see reflux has caused a lot of damage to esophagus. Majority of the time, people do have some symptoms. This is a foundation survey we did in 2010. I think it was in California at the last 2010 meeting. And this is what we found in 209 people with scleroderma. Heartburn, about 70. How many of you here have heartburn? No. Trouble swallowing. Bloating. So it's meeting, matching what I'm showing here because we are recording, people can't see your hands go up. Diarrhea constipation. And I will not ask you to raise your hand, but one thing that surprised me as a physician was fecal or rectal incontinence. And that to me, you know, when our people come, when the patients come to the clinic, they talk everything from the mouth to constipation, but they don't want to share the issues and the and the day-to-day -day, uh, activity limitation that happens because of fecal incontinence. So what's the function of the gut? The function of the gut is to push the food down, extract and absorb the nutrients, and it does that in a well-orchestrated motion of the gut muscle called peristalsis. So when you go to see a rheumatologist or gastroenterologist, they will talk about peristalsis. And peristalsis is a, is a movement that happens as you swallow and it goes down. What happens in scleroderma is the progressive weakening of the motion in the gut. You take your skin 
and most of the people with scleroderma have thick skin. Think about the collagen in the food pipe, stomach, lower bowel, are all have increased collagen around that. Because of that, you know, the weakening of the gut muscle, it starts to not function properly. The peristalsis is not very smooth and orchestrated. It's a unwitty motion that's happening and sometimes the esophagus and other parts of the gut stop to work. I only have one slide. Dr. Leader today gave an exceptional talk on mouth involvement and teeth, dental involvement in scleroderma. And he talked quite a bit on the issues of decreased oral aperture, dry mouth, dental issues. I think 20% of people even more have Sjogren's syndrome, which is dry eyes and dry mouth. And what I got from his talk, he did a very good talk, sugar-free gum, regular dental appointment, maybe dental cleaning three times a year instead of two times a year that we get, trial of different medications, FDA-approved medications that increase the saliva production in your mouth. Uh, but I think the most important part is to be aware of it and to treat it aggressively and, and, and be uh, up to it and see a dentist who knows what they are doing when it comes to dental cleaning and so forth. So reflux disease, people who don't have scleroderma, there are about 40 million people in US who have reflux. You see Brett Favre throwing a football, right, for the purple pill? You know, that's what is selling the Nexium for, for the reflux symptoms. It's really the liquid content of the stomach that comes up from the stomach and goes up into the food pipe or the esophagus. Anytime you eat a lot, anytime you are a bit obese, uh, those are the kind of the things that, or if you had a pizza or if you had a spicy food, that would cause that content to come up. It's actually quite natural when you eat a lot, people feel bloated, people burp, and that's the air under in your stomach that's trying to come up. In people who don't have scleroderma, there's a sphincter out here, a valve. It's a one-way valve. When you eat something, the valve opens. When you're done eating, the valve closes. And I can show you the video. Unfortunately, I have a Mac. I have a nice video that talks about it. It didn't work out in the window version of it. In scleroderma, the valve is open 90% of the time. So when you eat something, like you ate today, the chicken and the risotto and and the bread, and if you just now go and lie down, what will happen is the food in the stomach, as it should, you know, will start to creep up, causing reflux out here, giving you the symptoms of heartburn. And that's how, why reflux happens. Now, if the valve is working fine, what can you do? You can eat a little bit less, you can maybe lose some weight, you stop smoking if you smoke, and so forth. But there's really nothing you can do. People come and say, I don't want to take Prilosec. I don't want to take Prevacid. That, that's not an option here. We can talk about the complications of long-term proton pump inhibitors. But unfortunately, when the valve is not working, there's really nothing clinicians can do to prevent the acid. We have to neutralize the acid that's out here so that you don't get symptoms and damage caused by that acid into your food pipe. Here's a picture of a person with scleroderma where the esophagus should be a straight line and you see the dilated esophagus out here uh, and the sphincter that we talked about. Now when I talk about reflux symptoms, almost everybody has heartburn. Anybody who has been diagnosed with reflux and doesn't have heartburn? None of you. Difficulty swallowing. I heard a lot of you talking about difficulty swallowing. Difficulty swallowing is usually when people over time, the reflux causes damage to the inner layer of the food pipe and causes a stricture. And a, and, and a stricture looks like that. And you ate a nice chicken today. Chicken was quite moist, I was surprised. Most of the time, we tend not to serve chicken or steak 
at the scleroderma foundation meetings because they're dry and then it can get, get lodged here and the food is stuck here and you're having difficulty to push it down. Chest pain. Anybody here went to the ER saying I'm having chest pain, the ER doctor came said, and the cardiologist saw you, said hey, your heart is okay, must be something with the, with the GI. Uh, you know, that might cause, the reflux can cause chest pain. Change in voice, your voice is a little bit hoarse, and if you saw, heard Dr. Leader's talk, the acid is coming into the vocal cords, and by coming into the vocal cords, it's causing inflammation out there. Chronic cough, asthma, so those could be the symptomatologies of chronic reflux or GERD disease. 90% of the time we don't do anything. So if a person comes with scleroderma, we ask symptoms, most of the time they say a reflux and I'll talk about the treatment. But really the symptoms continue to go on and on and we are trying to figure out why is a person still having symptoms despite getting appropriate medication. We can do something called barium swallow. You swallow a radio opaque uh, medication and you see what the esophagus looks like. Well, you see the esophagus is kind of ballooned, right? The esophagus should come straight like that. And more importantly, you see this patient of mine has a stricture. In other words, that's why she says, whenever I eat any bread or meat or anything like that, the food gets stuck here. Well, you know why it does get stuck here. The only thing she was able to drink was liquids and she was losing a lot of weight. So it is helpful sometimes to do these studies to try to figure out why are the symptoms or difficulty swallowing happening. Has anybody ever had a barium swallow? Was it painful? No painful. Disgusting taste. <laughs> and when a gastroenterologist puts a tube into the upper esophagus, into the esophagus or food pipe, they find esophagitis, inflammation. That's a normal looking, pale looking inner lining of the food pipe and here's the inflammation and the damage that's happening. If that damage continues to happen over time, the body forms a hole and can cause peptic ulcer or a ulcer in the food pipe that can very, very rarely rupture, but more importantly, it can heal with a, with a stricture, like I told you. And that's probably what's happening, that people are having symptoms or really not having symptoms, but the acid is coming up and causing this inflammation. Another way to try to understand in a more medical way is to do something called manometry. How many of you had? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Quite a bit of you have had, uh, we have about 80 people here, so about 15% of you had manometry. Here is a person, you put a tube through your nose or your mouth into the food pipe, and they ask you to swallow. And you see the normal peristalsis that's happening here. Blip, blip, blip. One, two, three. And it's, it's like an EKG, an electrocardiogram, you know. It's showing that uh, the nerve are, are shooting. When you swallow or drink water, the nerves are shooting appropriately, trying to push everything down. Here's a person with scleroderma. You can see that it's a flat line. Another way to look at it is a high resolution manometry. So, swallowing, you swallow, people with scleroderma actually have a normal swallowing reflux. So that is usually normal. But as you go down, in a person without scleroderma, you see different pressures. The red means there's a lot of high pressure to push it down. And there's your lower esophageal sphincter or the valve I talked about. Here's one of my patients with scleroderma and you can see he, she only had the normal swallowing reflux but there's nothing happening here. You see that? <coughs> so it's very difficult medically to try to treat it uh, and you know try to, f most of the time we do manometry if somebody's a candidate for lung transplant. 
So they have lung fibrosis and we want to do lung transplantation, that's when we tend to do manometry. And, and, and you know, just to again to show how physiologically this looks like trying to explain this issue. The treatment of reflux, and I don't think I clarified that, when we talk about reflux, we think about acid. We think about hydrochloride coming from the stomach into the food pipe. But we forget that we have a gallbladder and we have bile in there. And that's alkaline, non-acidic reflux. You can take proton pump inhibitor, you can take Nexium, Prilosec, Prevacid, whatever you can, that will reduce the risk of damage and acidic reflux. But that will not impact at all your alkaline or bile reflux. So to do that, you really only have one choice, and that is to elevate your bed and sleep with a wedge pillow. How many of you do that? Well, how many of you don't do it? You sleep in a recliner. I think if there's one thing you can take from this talk is, really, this, or you can buy these blocks and you can raise the bed four to six inches. You have to really fight against the gravity. When you're lying flat, the valve is not working, the acid will come up, it will go into the esophagus, and believe it or not, you might swallow it into your lungs. And sometimes people get aspiration pneumonia. And there's some controversy to suggest that lung fibrosis may be, aspiration may be a factor in lung fibrosis. Whatever you do, do this is probably the one non-medicinal things that you can do. And we talked about inflammation and scarring of the esophagus can lead to a precancerous lesion. And I'll show you and talk about that. So, wedge pillow, blocks under the head, we talked about that. Do not put extra pillows. I know some of you do that, especially when you are in a meeting. <laughs> you're in a hotel, you know, you're, you're not going to carry your recliner with you or your wedge blocks to, to, to elevate it. So what's the problem with using instead of one, six, three pillows? You, you, you're sleeping like this, and as any time you do this, the pressure here pushes things up. So you try not to do that. Try to eat the biggest meal at noon, and again, small meals throughout the day. Uh, do not eat late, frequent small meals, and no tight garment around the waist. Same issue, if you really push your belt very fast, you know, the things can't go up or down. So we'll talk a, little, a lot about the medications. I hope none of you smoke here. If you do, this might be the time to stop smoking. You might have heard that when I gave this talk a few times, I used to say, avoid chocolate and coffee, and people were not happy with me. <laughs> so I say, avoid or minimize coffee and, and, and chocolate. Certain medications, nifedipine, which is used for Raynaud's, can make your valve even more incompetent. And that might cause increased reflux symptoms. So just be aware, if you need the medication, you do need the medication. These are the medications. They all work the same. I can, who, who have tried more than one medication? So which is the best one f you, you think is the best medication here? Nexium. Nexium. Protonics. Pevacid. So are they lying? You said Nexium, you said Prilosec, Prevacid. The bottom line here is which is a better non-steroidal? Is it Mobic? Is it Aleve? Is it Advil? The bottom line is whatever, see, whatever works for you is what you need to take. All of them are proton pump inhibitor. Uh, what they do is they inhibit or try to reduce the acid production by your stomach. The medication that I prescribe is what is covered by your insurance. So if you are coming with, to me, and now most of these medications are over the counter. You know, some of these medications are over the counter, but Prilosec, for example, I think it's 10 milligrams, if not 20 milligrams, or 20 milligrams might be over the counter. 
I will come to that. Famotidine is a weaker, it's a H2 blocker, which is a weaker form of the, the proton pump inhibitors. They are not that effective. Very rarely I would use Pepsid or, or Ranitidine or Famotidine in people with scleroderma. Try the medication, let's say Prilosec is on the tier one and you have to pay a $5 copay. That's okay to try Prilosec and you see the dose. That's the most important point. I don't know, I forgot my English, should be is two to four times used in general population here. Mm -hmm. 20 to 40, if you don't have scleroderma, you have reflux, most of the people take 20 milligrams once a day. If you have scleroderma, you might need 40 milligrams twice a day. Uh, do what you can to control that reflux, and I will talk a little bit of side effects. Let's say Prilosec didn't work for you. It didn't work for you. Then you, generally what I do, I go to the next tier medication on your, on your formulary. Because Dexilant, if you go to Dexilant and somebody said Dexilant works, might be non-formulary or tier three, which means $80 or $100 a month out of pocket. And with all the other medications you are taking, uh, so the point here is that if you have been newly diagnosed or new reflux, that might be a way to go. And the other point is that the dose that you require might be much higher than you are taking. Now there are side effects. Dr. Leader talked about and other people talked about on proton pump inhibitors. One is nausea. One is risk of osteoporosis. Majority of people who develop scleroderma average age is 50 years. Very rarely it happens below 40. 50 is the time when Medicare starts to, or your insurance starts to cover the, the bone density scan to look for osteoporosis. I tend to do that in all my patients with scleroderma because they have an autoimmune disease, because of GI malabsorption, and because of the proton pump inhibitor. There's a rare infection called C. diff infection. Has ever, anybody ever had that one? So you can see there are 80 of you sitting here, not all of you have scleroderma, but most of you do. But you can see how rare is this infection. It's a sudden onset of fever, diarrhea, sometimes bloody diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and could be difficult to treat. And when you kill that acid, there's a reason we have acid in our stomach. And when you really try to reduce the production of that acid, sometimes some of the bacteria can get away from being destroyed in the stomach and go into the lower bowel and can cause infection. You need to be aware of it. And if you are aware of it, anytime you have fever, chills, abdominal pain, diarrhea, especially bloody diarrhea, you should be seeing somebody immediately for that. You can talk about fecal transplant, that is. Uh, but the question is, do you, the question one of you should ask is then why should I take these medications? Uh, and I don't think we have, we have any, any choice because of the things that I talked about. You will be miserable. I mean, some of you who are here in the meeting probably forgot your proton pump inhibitor and you're asking your next door, <laughs> next person that do, do they have extra proton pump inhibitor. And especially suddenly if you stop it, there's a rebound that happens and people really feel miserable about it. In addition, we use the pro-motility agents to increase the motility of the gut. So I showed you the valves is competent. We can't do anything about it. The acid and alkaline is being produced. We are asking you to sleep at an angle. We gave you Prilosec three times a day or twice a day. But we have not done anything for the motility of the gut. The gut, the esophagus is still not working. I showed you that patient of mine where the food pipe was not working at all. Now what should we do there? You could try medications like Reglan, Erythromycin, Domperidone, which is F and different medications to increase the gut motility. They are rather modest. They don't work very well, but there are some of the medications that we use to increase the motility. Anything that works or any sensation you have, you have nerves out here. The nerves gives you the sensation of pain, burning sensation, or whatever it might be. We have nerves in our food pipe that move the gut. When the collagen increases in your gut, it stifles those nerves. 
and eventually kills those nerves. And as the nerves are being stifled, you know, these medications might work. But once the nerves are dead, there's really nothing you can give from a medication standpoint to move the, the muscles. The third point, take home point. Medication should be taken at least 30 to 60 minutes before me you eat. Most of the people take proton pump inhibitors, especially prokinetics, after you have eaten or along with your breakfast. You want the medication to be on board when you're eating. Usually we start at Prilosec once a day. If you're still having symptoms in 14 days, twice a day, add Pepsi or Tagamet at bedtime, add Domperidone, but if the symptoms are still not controlled, then we refer you, we do a barium swallow, we refer you to a gastroenterologist who does a scope, make sure that we are not missing something. Most of the time, if the symptoms are still continuing, you have candida of your esophagus, which is a fungal infection. Because some of you might be on methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, Celsep, mycophenolate, you're already immunocompromised. Now we have added proton pump inhibitors that is uh, supporting the, the normal organisms of the gut are, are somewhat disturbed. Thrush. 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 So thrush is in the mouth. Thrush. It's in the food pipe, usually the upper part of the food pipe. Anybody here has Barrett's esophagus? One, two, three, four, five. So again, it is rare, but not that rare. Uh, about 7 to 13% of people with scleroderma despite getting chronic therapy with proton pump inhibitor. Now, why is that important? It's a precancerous lesion that if you don't take care of it properly, it can turn into a cancerous lesion over time. It's rather rare because once the gastroenterologists find it out, depending how bad it is, they might burn that area. Very rarely they cut that area off. So it's usually in the lower part of the esophagus where it connects to the stomach. They might cut that area and, and sew it back. Or they might do endoscopy every year to every two years to keep a close eye on it. Anybody ever had surgery? Did it work? Yes. Okay. What kind of surgery did you have? Okay. What about the food pipe? It's damaged. It's damaged. So she's on TPN. She's getting parenteral denutrition. Okay. So. No. Well, you can do it. I think that's what she had. So I'm going to go back a few slides trying to explain. I did, too. I had esophagitis. So you, you got your esophagus taken care of. OK. So here's a person who doesn't have scleroderma. And you can see the nice motility of the esophagus. Here's a person who has scleroderma, and the esophagus is not working. Now, there's your esophagus, there's your stomach, and there's a valve that we talked about, you know, the, the one-way valve that happens. I told you that if the food pipe is not working and I put a, I put do Nissan fund duplication, which is really putting a wrap around it, or very rarely you remove the esophagus and the problem. Well, they, they did the fund application. Their fund application. So the problem, she said, fund application requires that your stomach and your food pipe are working well. Fund application would work if the, the, the floppy valve is the main issue, but the food pipe was intact. And when you eat, ate something, the food pipe said, OK, it's time for me to work. And I will work the way it's supposed to work. And I'll push my way through this floppy valve that we have created a valve, uh, a flap around it. But in a person with scleroderma, majority of the times is what she's talking about. The food comes here and just sits here. Because the food pipe doesn't have the strength to push it back, uh, down. Uh, fortunately, due to proton pump inhibitors, 
University of Michigan that sees about, we see about 2,000 people every year with eight to 10 new patients a week. I think I have referred two patients in the last four years for fund application or surgery and both of the time the cardiothoracic surgeon said no, uh, it, is, it is too risky to do. Fund application is usually done in people if they are getting lung transplant and they have too much reflux, sometimes they do that in, in those events. Okay. <laughs> so like I said, severe, poorly controlled, very rarely, again, it's very rare, one or two people over a database of 2,000 people, that people are sitting like you are, and they're still having reflux. You do a study in them, they're taking every medication you can think about, and they're sitting straight, and I don't know how, but the acid is still coming up. So they can't even lie down. Those are the kind of people that we think about. With, but with the proton pump inhibitor, those issues have become really, really rare. Is that with the rheumatic No, I'm just saying without. Now, now, usually we don't do the esophagectomy that you talked about because the mortality during the esophagectomy is quite high. But, you know, I'm happy that you did well. Whoever you do, please go to an experienced surgeon. There are very few people around the country. Where did you get it done? Okay. Good. So you have something in northeast to get it done. In the northeast corridor. So there's somebody usually even at 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 Michigan. I we do Michigan or send them to Pittsburgh. So we will move down to the stomach now. Uh, the main problem is again, slowing of the stomach, throw, emptying the stomach into the small bowel, bloating, nausea, vomiting, and weight loss. Gastric emptying study. So you take half a jelly sandwich with four rounds of apple juice, and you take something that's radio labeled, and you take the food, time zero, 15, 30, 45, 60 minutes, and 90 minutes the food is gone. It goes away from the stomach into the small bowel. That's how it should happen. In a person with scleroderma, this is at the end of 120 minutes, but the food is just not moving. Well, if the food is sitting here, what will happen? You'll feel bloated. You'll feel distended. You will feel, you don't want to eat, you will feel nausea because the food is coming up, especially with the uh, majority of the people who have esophageal involvement also have some degree of uh, stomach lining involvement and weakening of it. And that's why, again, we don't have very good medication. Eating small meals would help move this food down rather than eating a big lunch like we had today. Now that food in some of people, I hope not somebody's here, but might sit in, in your stomach for the last, next eight hours. Uh, and, and, and we have done studies where a person comes today, they wait for four hours and come next day, the food is still sitting there in the stomach, very rarely, but it happens. So if you eat small meals, the food will go down appropriately. This is where we use these medication and they tend to work a little bit better, but again, some of you, does anybody take these medications? Do they help? Seem to help. Okay. We can talk about that. Yeah. Who else take these medications? Does it work? Any of these medications? So kind of work. You know, nobody would say like proton pump inhibitors. If you have acid reflux, you take Nexium. They most of the time they work very well. But when it comes to the pro motility agents, most of the people say, yeah, kind of they work. Yeah, so domperidon was never filed in US. All these medications have one common side effect. 
they cause in certain people who are at risk, they can cause irregular heartbeat and sudden death because of that. All these medications have exactly the same erythromycin, Reglan, Domperidone, and Propulsate. So, you know, that's why FDA never approved the drug. But you can get it, you know, if I write a prescription, there, were, there are some compounding pharmacies that can make Domperidone for you. Uh, regarding the question Reglan and side effects, Reglan crosses the blood brain barrier. There's a barrier between your brain and the rest of the body. And Reglan molecule is able to cross his domperidone doesn't. The most common side effects of Reglan is depression. Uh, but some people get involuntary movements called tardive dyskinesia. That is very rare. the tardive dyskinesia, which is an involuntary. But again, you know, the choices are rather limited. Uh, but the best thing that I hope I'm trying to get across is that the control is in your hands at this time where we are with the medicinal therapy. Sleeping at an angle, eating small meals, knowing what are the things that flare your reflux, uh, especially when you're traveling for these meetings and not able to get your appropriate rest, things in the gut tend to flare up. Watermelon stomach, how many of you? Yeah, that's a watermelon stomach. It looks like the outer part of the watermelon. If you, if you, if you ever, I'm sure you have eaten watermelon. And, and a stomach should have normal lining like this, but you see these strands out here. And if you think about the outside of the watermelon, and what it, these are, these are the telangiectasias that you have on the face and they can intermittently bleed, and they can cause anemia or low hemoglobin. Uh, it's usually early in the disease, usually early diffuse scleroderma. In the stem cell transplant study, Dr. Mace published, because everybody had a upper GI endoscopy, about 20% of the people had evidence of this watermelon stomach. A lot of the times it's there. It's not doing anything, and we don't do anything. But they can have intermittent bleeding, and to treat that, the gastroenterologist goes with the coagulation, a burning stick, and really burns off these areas. And you can see how diffuse it is out here, and he's starting to burn it, but it will take a while. So you might need one therapy, 10 therapies, 20 therapies sometime because of that. Moving down to the small bowel, Small bowel plays a very important role because small bowel is where everything is absorbed. All the chicken and the risotto that you ate, you know, the nutrients, whether good or bad, will be absorbed there. What happens in scleroderma is that you need a bowel which is over 100 feet or so long, small bowel. You know, it's kind of a convoluted python that's going in your stomach. Uh, the loss of muscle tone stagnates the food out there. And the bacteria that live in a large bowel start to creep into the small bowel. When you leave food to decay and stagnate, you know, bacteria will figure out a way to get there. And that what leads to diarrhea, constip diarrhea cramping, feeling of bloating, and that's what's called bacterial overgrowth syndrome. Now, do you have bacterial overgrowth syndrome? How were you diagnosed with bacterial overgrowth? Well, because I was having constipation, vomiting, and diarrhea. Yeah. And I did that's exactly what um, my gastrologist explained to me. It's because my, my movement of my stomach was not working, and I was backing up. And when I was backing up, I was having the fluid overflow. Mm. stool softener, and we can come to that. <laughs> Probably the most common cause of weight loss. So if you are not gaining weight, or if you're losing weight, the two key parts are either depression, it plays a big role, especially in early, or bacterial overgrowth. Those are the two main reasons of losing 
weight that a scleroderma specific. Uh, malabsorption of essential vitamins and you can do something called a breath test where we give you a sugar water, glucose and we ask you to drink it and then we wait for that water to reach into the large bowel where all of us have bacteria. Well, when the bacteria see all the sugar come through, they start to make something called H2 and you see this large nice in your mouth after about 90 minutes. Remember I talk, told you that if from your mouth to stomach, your food should be out within 30 minutes. And by the time, if your gut is working fine, it, at about 90 minutes or so, the food should be in the large bowel. So if you have a, a valve in your mouth and trying to measure it, a person who doesn't have bacterial overgrowth has this and then you have this. But if the bacteria is in the small bowel, then you get a blip because the bacteria is starting to ingest that sugar and you get that blip. And that's how we diagnose the bacterial overgrowth syndrome. The treatment is very different. Treatment is antibiotics. And sometimes people require antibiotics for a month. And most of the people require cyclic antibiotics. You took a course of rifampin, then flagyl and cipro. Some people need it every month every other month or when the symptoms come. Dramatic sudden improvement in the symptoms as soon as you start antibiotics. But it's not curative because we have not done anything to increase the movement of the gut. All we have done is try to clean the pipe with the Drano, but the gunk will come back again. So the bacteria will start to grow back again. To deal with that, again, we try pro-motility agents, but I have to acknowledge that we don't do a very good job. And again, when the nerve roots are dying off, there's really nothing you can do at that time to tell the gut. If you have a stroke and arm is not working, it's not working. You hope that with physical therapy and over time, the nerve roots might regrow. Think about that. It's not a stroke, but it's a slow death of the nerve roots because of the collagen constricting and suffocating them. So I talked about the antibiotics on and off, initial antibiotics to decrease the load, different antibiotics and multivitamin and calcium every day. Dr. Freck talked about probiotics today. How many of you take probiotics? Do we? <laughs> so there are about 20 people who take it, and why do you take it? You said okay. It helps. Thought it would help. Anybody else? Okay. She can't function without it, so it helps her. Okay, so your doctor told you to take it. Anybody else? Trying something that would help. Makes your stomach feel better. So what are probiotics? And, and do you take a certain brand, or do you take which is the cheapest over the counter? So what's expensive pill do you take? I, it's, I don't know, something probiotic. Like now I get it on Amazon, but the doctor recommends, I can't remember the name correctly. Like, I don't like to use it, but Cultural. Cultural. Anybody takes a line? A line? A line. A L I G N. Anybody takes over the counter? I'm uh, not over the counter. A store brand, Costco brand, Kroger brand, Walgreen brand. So the probiotics are supposedly healthy bacteria that you all of us should have in our large bowel. And probiotics helps to control the health of the gut in there. Uh, there really has not been any studies in scleroderma whether the probiotics are helpful, but each capsule has very different probiotics. So a probiotic it's not same as if you take a leaf from Walgreen versus a leaf from the company versus a leaf from Kroger, Walmart, and so forth. Each probiotic has very different mix of bacteria. So you might try a line probiotic and it's not helpful, but cultural might be very helpful for you. Take something that is regulated, that's all I can say, uh, 
and a lot of studies that have been done, some of these brands don't have any bacteria at all. They are all inactive, they're, they're called probiotics. One thing that I have to alert you with probiotics, and we tried to do a study in probiotics and the help with probiotics in this distension bloating which majority of people have. The FDA came back to us and said, we won't let you do the study. And I said, why? They said, because these are live bacteria. So if you are getting chemotherapy, or if you just got stem cell transplant, I would stay away from probiotics because there have been very rare cases where the bacteria caused infection of the blood called sepsis. Very, very rare cases, but they have been reported in people who are really immunocompromised. Yeah, the cultural is mentioned because one of the gastroenterologists I work with, you know, that's what he uses. But I think the point here is take a, a, a regulated, uh, take something, but each pill from a different company have completely different set of bacteria. One pill have three bacteria and cultural might have three different bacteria, line might have three different bacteria. So don't take one probiotic is same as other, like we say, a leaf from Walgreen should be same as a leaf from Kroger, because that's how FDA regulates them. Question. Yeah. How does the probiotic work in, I mean, we're putting healthy bacteria in, which hopefully makes a healthier, healthier gut, but does that make, change our motility or anything like that? If, if we take a survey out here, most of the people here would say yes, that probiotic helps them with their gut health, it helps to regulate their bowel movement, it helps to improve their motility. I guess I know it does. But... <laughs> well, because you are, you are regulating the gut health. Now, we don't know whether it does, we feel it does. I think when you look at placebo controlled studies, the placebo does the same thing. So that's why I'm not very strongly advocating probiotics here, acknowledging that we don't have placebo-controlled trials. And Dr. Lafiatas will talk after this on the emerging therapies. And one thing he will emphasize is that how important is the trials that we do with inactive medications. For example, in scleroderma skin studies that we have done, I have designed many of them, people tend to get better during the trial. Most of the people improve despite being on placebo. Why? Uh, how does placebo helps to, so when you are taking a pill, maybe the brain is sending a signal that you are taking a real medication, so you should start to feel better. And, and so that's why I'm not emphasizing the use of probiotics, acknowledging that people take it, people feel better about it. I don't want to say not take it, but just be aware that there are no trials. The nutrition part is very brief. If you're losing weight, see a nutritionist who deals with people losing weight. Uh, I mean, who are losing weight. Most of the nutritionists in this country are to help people lose weight, not help people gain weight. Okay, so you need to find a nutritionist who can help you gain weight. Uh, one of the things is to adoptation of food map diet, which are diets which is in high sugar, uh, fermentable oligosaccharides, lactose, and you know, they are, they're, they're different sugars that can give you severe distension bloating, especially ones with sorbitol, mannitol, and so forth. But this has really to work with the nutritionist what to do, what not to do. Uh, this will tell you don't eat wheat. Don't eat sugar, don't eat apples, don't eat, well then you say, what am I supposed to eat then? So you really have to work with a nutritionist. If you're taking things away from your diet, you need to put calories and nutrition in your body. So it has to be not going and buying a food bag book or, or trying to work with a nutritionist so you're getting adequate nutrition. Pseudo obstruction, has anybody ever had pseudo obstruction? We are almost done here, one person, so again two. It's rare. Pseudo obstruction is an extreme case of bacterial overgrowth. The bacteria has been there so much 
that the gut says, thank you very much, I am tired, I am not going to move. No, I didn't have that. Okay. Uh, and this is distension vomiting, but the critical period is that the gut is visually double, triple the size and you are not able to pass any gas. So you start to have nausea, vomiting, and you need to go to the hospital to make sure you don't have real obstruction. A person with scleroderma could have a mass, a colon cancer or something that's causing obstruction, but pseudo-obstruction is the gut is good. The gut is moving really well, but the gut is open. But the pipe says, I don't want to work. Thank you. Uh, and, and here's a gut, that gut should be, but you see how distended the gut is. When you give the barium, I mean, the gut should be this, this size. It's kind of, and you can see the flexibility of the gut, how much gut can move. We will end with colon. Uh, the purpose of the large bowel is to take everything, all the nutrients that small bowel has taken, reabsorb the water, and help you form the stool. So constipation is different. We don't have a time. I would have asked you. Most of the people say constipation is if I only go to three times a week. That's fine. If that's what you do and you don't have hard or lumpy stools and you don't have a feeling of incomplete evacuation or strain, that's fine. A lot of people do that. Not everybody has a bowel movement on a daily basis. But if you have those symptoms that you feel you have not evacuated properly or you have lumpy stools or you're straining during the bowel movements, that's a definition of constipation. So most of us, for, if we are constipated, we take, start, increase our fibers. That's a wrong thing to do in scleroderma. So let me explain you why. The normal constipation is you're not taking enough fluids, you're not taking enough fibers, so food is, uh, the stool is getting lumpy. In scleroderma, the constipation is because the gut is weak and the colon is not moving at a speed that the thing should move. So here is stool moving through the colon and the colon is absorbing water from the stool. So you have a big formed stool and it's getting hard, 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 hard and so forth. And then you add fibers to it. Well, the, the stool mass is double now, but it's a hard lumpy stool mass because all the water has been extracted from it. If your constipation is truly scleroderma associated and there are tests you can find out, then we try to give stimulant laxatives to push again, you know, the issue of really trying to move the gut with whatever medication that we have. And these medications are here and it's in the, uh, the article that you have in, in front of you. So just remember that you might be taking a lot of fibers and you're constipated and you're thinking, why am I constipated still? I should be having a good bowel movement because the medications that we are giving you is for a person who's not eating well. It's not for our soul, slow bowel constipation. Somebody talked about paradoxical diarrhea where you can get di diarrhea around the constipation. And at the end, fecal incontinence, a huge issue. And it's because of weakening of the rectal sphincter. And the sphincter is there to control or squeeze and be aware when you are about to have a bowel movement. The treatments that you can do, Kegel exercises, but what I have been, and again, I'm not able to play it on this computer, but I can show you, is sacral nerve stimulation. So sacral nerve are the nerves in your tailbone that control your urinary bladder and your rectum. And if you stimulate these sphincters, uh, not sphincters, the nerves, because the sphincters are still working, I told you it's nerve weakness, but unlike here, I can't put a, a electrode somewhere in the food pipe, although it would be great if I can move. But the gastroenterologist or surgeons can put a electrode back here that can activate and stimulate your sacral nerves. And when they do that, what they found, and this has been shown again and again in five patients in London, where before that they were having anywhere from two to 58 episodes of fecal incontinence, it went down to zero, almost everybody. So what the surgeons do is, 
It's usually done by a gynecologist because they are the one they put it for urinary incontinence, but like I said, the nerves control both the urine and the fecal sphincters, is they put a temporary one just to make sure that it will help you. It is as thin as if you put two credit cards together. And if it works, then they implant a, a pacemaker into your tailbone uh, that controls. We had a very few patients who have gone through that, but they are very, very happy because the issue of fecal incontinence finally could be, could be taken care of. And is the liver cirrhosis or primary biliary cirrhosis an autoimmune cirrhosis, not alcohol related, usually with limited or crest syndrome, and a lot of people have no symptoms, and with a simple blood test that are usually done on a regular basis, we can find out and there's good treatment for this. So I will move past that due to time and will conclude that frequently people have symptoms, not just impact on quality of life, but also can have significant issues. And a lot of time we need to do this test to really diagnose. Example, bloating can come from poor gastric emptying. It can come from bacterial overgrowth. The treatments are two completely different. If you have gastric emptying problem, take small meals, pro-motility agents. If you have bacterial overgrowth, antibiotics is the way to go. And with that, I thank you for listening.